For this painting, um, I've got a basic sketch here. Um, and as you can see, uh, it's got um, the main layer, which has the drawing on it. And then I have my reference photo. I always keep my reference photo as close as possible whenever I work on this stuff. And then I've got my color palette, um, where I've just kind of created uh, basic skin tones. And these are the skin tones I'll be using throughout the figure. Um, and so i kind of zooming in here and just getting a, a good reference uh, for my reference photo. And then the <clears throat> uh, very first step here uh, is to start blocking in color. And when I block in that color, I'm going to keep it really, really intense and just all sorts of tone. Um, I'm not worried so much about painting the skin. This is uh, for the underlying color. Um, and in Painter, one thing that's really neat about how it works is you can uh, use pickup underlying color. And when you use pickup underlying color, um, what it can do is it will actually blend that into the skin tones. Um, and so what I do is I put in just the generic skin tones of what the face is. Um, and I use them really, really intense. Uh, and so, for example, the nose and the cheek, it's going to be high purples and pinks and tones like that. Um, and then when you come in for the, uh, the other parts of the face, such as the, the lower jaw, it tends to going to be the bluish tones and the cooler tones um, that you see normally on a face. You have to be careful when you're painting females though not to get too blue because then it gives them a five o'clock shadow. Um, and then the next thing is then I kind of work in some yellow tones up near the, the eyes and the, the cheeks and some of that around the forehead. And I just continue painting the underlying color for all the skin tones um, as I work through this piece. Um, and just trying to uh, create um, as much contrast in color so that as when I do go to put the skin tones on, um, some of these colors are going to uh, be put into the actual painting. Try to mix between cools and warms. So I put cool tones where the shadows are going to be and warmer tones into the highlights. And it's kind of one of those, as you, the more you paint, the more you do this, the, the more you're going to kind of understand is what tones you're going to want to put into there. Um, for example, um, putting the, the purple on the legs, you know, that I kind of knew what was going to happen. And the green, I know, is going to turn it more gray. And so just kind of as you work through this, you know, that you'll learn what you should be putting down um, just through experimentation. Um, and so the more you experiment, the better you'll get with it. So you if you're doing painting and you're going to try this technique don't worry about what your end result will be just try some things and put the paint over it sometimes it'll be a success sometimes not so much um, if you find your paint when you put the skin tones over the top if it doesn't do what you're thinking you want it to do then erase the underlying color and then paint something different um, and, and then eventually you'll get better at it and you'll figure out what cut what tones you need to put down first and how it'll look better Once I've finished adding all that tone in there, um, the next thing I want to do is I'm going to blur um, all of that. And it's important that you blur it because if you don't, you're going to end up with really harsh lines underneath. Um, I found out that out the hard way. So I add a heavy blur to it, and then what I do is I lower the opacity. 
because I don't want it to be too intense. Um, I don't want my skin tones all of a sudden turn super pink on me. Um, so I lower that intensity um, and soften that back quite a bit. Okay, this next phase, I'm actually going to be putting in the skin tones themselves. Um, so I create a new layer. Um, I always like to um, use as many layers as, as I can. Um, it's probably not a good idea, um, but it's how I work. I just fear commitment when it comes to um, my painting, especially in the early phases. Um, so uh, make sure that underlying color is picked up here, and I'm using my wet oily brush and just uh, blocking it in. I try to use a fairly decent sized brush with this. I don't go too noodly with it um, at this phase. I'm just trying to block in basic skin tones and pulling from my palette every once in a while. If I get really confused, sometimes I'll pull, I'll just do a little bit of um, sampling from the photo. Um, I try not to do that as much as possible because then it looks too, too much like the photograph. Um, but uh, every once in a while I get really confused with color and, and just, I get frustrated and grab the sample from the photo. But I try to, like I said, I try to do that as sparingly as possible um, because then you become a slave to the photo. Um, so I'm just blocking it in and putting in the tones as I see them. Um, and I'm just trying to basically just paint what I see in my reference um, at this phase. I'm not too worried about my overall tone. Um, I'm just trying to get it as accurate as I can. For whatever reason, I usually start with the nose. It sounds a little bit ridiculous, but that's that's how I start most of my pieces. Um, some people start with the eyes, some people start with the lips. I don't think it really matters um, as long as it's where you're comfortable with. I think part of the reason why I end up painting the nose is um, it's probably going to be the, the darkest value of skin tone that you're going to have on the face because of the shadow that falls underneath it. Um, and so I think that's probably the reason why I start there, um, but I don't know. It's just it's just what I do. Um, so take it for what it's worth. Um, and so I just continue blocking in the face and the nose and, and just add more and more detail as I just watching what I paint and watching what I see in my reference and continuing to paint what I see. Okay, as I continue this, you'll notice when I'm working on the highlights, um, I'm not just using a white. Um, you'll notice if you look over in the color area, it's not white. It, it's, it's actually a pretty dark gray, um, but the local color around it is what's going to make it look like a highlight. So it's all the colors around it that are going to make it look darker. Um, so that's one thing that's really important as you're painting. Um, don't always necessarily trust, you know, that just because it's a highlight, doesn't mean you want to use white. Um, like right here, I'm using it's pretty much a mid-tone, um, but it looks really bright because of all the colors around it. So always be aware of the colors around the, the, the face or, or anything you're painting um, around it because that'll determine how dark or how light you should go. And if you go too light, it'll give it an effect where it looks like it's been overexposed. So don't be afraid to go a little darker in your highlights. Um, painting in lips is one of those things that a lot of people, when they go to paint in lips, they end up painting them too red or too dark. In reality, lips are just slightly tinted, and this is what makes this is one of the reasons why, it, for me, painter is so fantastic. Is it's going to pick up that underlying color, so I can pretty much just use normal skin tones, and that pick up underlying color will add the pink to the lips for me. So I just keep painting the skin tones as I see them, and that underlying color is going to push it to be that, that pinkish tone that I want. Um, so I don't have to worry too much about, you know, oh, is it pink enough and things like that because painter will do it for me with the pickup underlying color. Somewhat the masters used to do that too is they would paint an underlying, uh, an underneath underpainting really intense colors and as they paint over it, some of those colors would show through on the canvas and, and show through the canvas and show through the paint, especially if they painted thin enough. 
you know, and so you could get those effects, and that's similar to what Painter's kind of mimicking when you're using the pickup underlying color. So I'm not adding a lot of reddish tones to the lips, but as you can see, it, it ends up picking up a lot of that pink and putting it in there for me, so it looks like natural like lips. You know, a lot of times people make the mistake of when they paint lips, they paint with way too much red, way too much pink, or even purple in them. There's not a lot of shift between skin tones when it comes to lips and those types of things. Okay, um, getting eye shapes right is really important when it comes to faces. Um, the eyes are so absolutely expressive. Um, if you miss the eye shapes, you know, you're, you're, you're dead in the water when it comes to your faces. So I like to spend a little bit of extra time when I'm working on eyes um, in making sure that those shapes and those shadows are exactly right. Um, I'll use a smaller brush as I work through here. Um, I'll grab a detail brush and really get in there and make sure those shapes are right the first time um, because it can really uh, destroy your confidence if your eyes are in really poor condition um, as you're working through your piece. So Take a little bit extra time when you're painting in eyes to make sure that they're, they're spot on and, and that the shapes are good because um, it's almost like looking into the soul or so to speak um, when you're painting in the eyes. I'm also using a little bit of red um, where I'm using a little bit more intense colors um, as, I learn, as I work on the, eyelid, the eyelids. Um, as I paint in the actual eye, whites of the eye, notice I'm not using a white. It's a, it's a more of a bluish tone. Um, and you don't want it, you want to make sure that you don't go too bright on there. Um, it's better to have them just a little bit darker uh, than it is to go too bright because um, it, it can really make it look like the eyes glow if you go way too bright. Here I'm painting in her midsection um, here, and one of the things that's important as you kind of work through this is even though the, the painting itself or the photograph may have um, certain kind of colors and skin tones, um, it's a good idea to kind of add some extra colors to it. Like, for example, in some of my shadows, I've got some purples in here and some other tones and little bits of green and things like that. Some of that's going to be picked up through underlying color, but some of it's also going to be picked up by actual choices um, that I make as I go through this phase. Um, so I'd want to be sure that my shadows don't look too flat um, or too too basic. The other thing that's really important is you'll notice that shadow on the right um, that's cast from the sword. I lightened that up 
uh, quite a bit from what it actually looks like in the photo. You want to be sure that you don't have it be too much like um, exactly what you see in the photo uh, so that that way you know it can be a little bit different. Now here as I'm painting in the leg, one of the things you'll notice is that in the photo it looks pretty flat in tone. Um, so I'm going to bring out a little bit more of those tones as I go in to paint this leg. Um, I want to be sure that it doesn't look too flat. Um, in the photograph there's a lot of subtle colors, but I'm going to exaggerate those a little bit, those highlights and darks, because in a painting if you, if you paint it exactly the way that it looks, um, oftentimes it'll tend to flatten out on you. So I want to try and intensify some of those highlights and dark areas as I go through this um, painting and also some of the shadows I want to be sure that they don't get too dark um, so I don't want to use that really dark black like you see in the photograph along that edge of that leg um, so I'm going to lighten that up and use more of a brownish tone um, in there to try and help add a little bit more depth to it without it getting too flat or too harsh on the edge. Painting in hands is one of the things that you want to make sure you always do really, really well. Um, <clears throat> I've heard it said before that any illustrator that can paint hands and faces uh, is always going to be employed. Um, so I've kind of taken that as one of my mantras is that I always try to make sure that whenever I paint hands that I paint them as, as absolutely the best I can. I mean, hands can be just as expressive as faces, sometimes even more. Um, you can almost speak when a lot of people do is they speak with their hands. Um, and so when you're painting hands, you try your very best to make sure that, that they really make sense and that they, they're believable. And, and so take your time when you're painting hands, almost as much as time you're taking when you're painting eyes and, and lips and, and noses and mouths <coughs> to make sure that it really translates um, to what you're trying to express with the hands. Uh, also notice in the highlights here, I'm using those a little bit more purples and tones like that. Um, as I paint in the hands um, to make sure that I'm getting those those values right um, and sometimes I'll even you know it's so critical with the hands sometimes I'll even actually sample the color over from the photo just to make sure those relationships are right because I'd rather make sure I get it right at this phase um, than sit here and struggle with it for hours and hours um, so if you need to sample it sample it do whatever you need to do to make sure those are good hands um, and that's what I'm doing with this one is I'm really taking my time to get them right. Um, so when you're painting hands, always get them, spend that little bit of extra time just to get them spot on with the fingers and the back of the hands and all the knuckles and everything else to get those value relationships right. You can always add tones and color later, but those value relationships, are there's so many subtle changes, you got to get that just spot on as you paint. 
Okay, at this phase I've decided the skin is too dark. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new layer by duplicating my original layer with all my skin tone on it. And then I'm going to apply this uh, screen to that layer. Um, and by doing that, uh, it allows me to lighten up the skin tone everywhere. Um, but I don't want it to be all evenly lit. So what I'll do is I slightly erase some of the, some of the screen layer. Um, and then I'm going to back it off just a little bit to create that tone. Okay, when you're painting in armor, um, especially like leather armor, uh, one of the things you want to make sure you do is you don't paint everything the same even brown. You just don't paint a little bit of white and a little bit of brown mixed together. Um, you want to vary that. You want to work between cools and warms. Um, so like for example with this one, my darker areas are tending to be just a little bit warmer. Um, and then as they come into the highlights, um, I'm using more of a cool gray so that I'm not even using a white necessarily. It's more just a kind of a cool gray. So I have that balance between, between light and dark um, to get some of that tone. Um, and as you can see off to the side, I do have a reference that I'm working with, a piece of leather um, that I've photographed so I can kind of see how those tones actually look. Um, and, and so I'm not just kind of guessing at this. I've actually photographed it under the lighting that I want so I can really see what those colors are going to do. Whenever you're painting in metal, like swords or, or armor or anything that's got a metal tint to it or a fender of a car, um, one of the things you need to do is you need to really understand how the light's going to hit it. Um, so first off, it's a great idea to have some sort of a reference, even if it's just you know a piece of metal. It doesn't even have to be the actual item that you're going to use, but just look at it in the lighting conditions that you'd actually be using. So for example, here I'm in my reference, I actually have the model holding the actual sword. Um, so I can see how the light's going to hit it. The other thing is you want to have really dramatic shifts between lights and darks, especially if you're using a shiny metal. Um, it's also a good idea to decide on what kind of metal you're using. You know, if it's going to be a brushed metal or something that, that looks like brushed metal, you know, you might want to get a, a piece of brushed metal to really look at how that light's going to refract off of it versus a piece of polished metal because they're going to refract differently. Um, and so you want to have those range of values and, and accurate to the type of metal you're using um, because that helps create that realism that it's believable in the environment.
Okay, when I went in here and painted the vines on the chair, um, I wanted to be sure that the vines looked um, very, you know, gnarly and, and bent around and things like that. So when you're painting things like vines and stuff, it's a really good idea to look at actual vines. Um, you can't see it here on the screen, but, you know, I had an actual reference of the vines uh, and how these vines would wrap around. Um, just as kind of a reference, just kind of idea to give it kind of a thorny feel. Um, so it feels like these vines are intertwined with each other and it just gives this chair a much more rustic feel. So it's not just like an ordinary chair or an ordinary throne. It, it kind of has a little bit more of a fantasy feel to it. Okay, here I'm working in the background. Um, when you're painting in your backgrounds, uh, it's important to, to not go too dark um, too quick. Um, some people start with the backgrounds and paint that in first. It's probably a good idea. I've just always been one of those people that kind of paints backwards. Um, so, you know, I've tried it both ways and, and, and it works fine painting the background first or, or painting the figure first um, for me. Uh, you know, it, so it's really whichever preference you prefer. Um, but for digitally, it, since you're working in layers, a lot of times you can, you know, you can just put <clears throat> the background in second. So, um, you know, that's what I'm doing here on this one. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do with this is I'm trying to make it look like there's a lot of depth behind her. I don't want, I want this to feel like a large jungle that expands way back. So to do that, I'm using very uh, dull, duller color. So the green isn't very intense. It's kind of a, a muted green. And my lighter tones are this uh, muddy kind of uh, greenish white tone. And, and so I'm trying to really push that distance back behind her um, as I paint in these trees and these, you know, kind of palm trees and the vines and those kind of things like that and foliage. You know, and I'm not going in there and I'm not painting in every little leaf. You know, I'm just trying to get the big shapes right because a lot of times with backgrounds, as long as your big shapes are right, your silhouettes are good. And you add just a little bit of tone in there, um, you can really get a really believable background with, you know, outputting in every little detail. You know, I'm just trying to imply these idea of these little leaves and these little forms um, in the bushes. And it's just really subtle changes in value. You don't need huge shifts in value. Just very subtle changes can go a long way when you're working with the background. Um, sometimes when you're working with backgrounds, um, you, have, you can have a tendency to get a little bit too monochromatic. Um, and that's kind of what happened to me here um, on this image. So to fix that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to literally go in and just flood in some color um, back behind on top of the bushes. Um, so for example, you can see I'm putting in some, some pinks and, and purplish tones um, back behind the, the tigers on that mid layer there. And so I want to just start to flood in some color. Um, and so I'm just basically taking that, turning it into an overlay layer, and then just shading it back and then erasing, softening up my edges. 
So it has just a hint of purple. Now I don't want it to be over the top and make it look like purple bushes. Um, so I'm going to continue to push that back as I work on this. Um, but I do want there to be more color to it and I don't want it to be quite so monochromatic. Also I wanted some yellowish tones kind of poking through the trees um, as, as you look at it. I wanted there to be some, some light coming through that so it really feels like you know it's a canopy of trees but there's a, an intense sunlight behind her. Um, and so to do that I'm just flooding in some yellow back behind there. Um, then what I'll do is I'll soften up all those edges on that um, and then I'll throw it on into an overlay layer. Um, and that'll help make it look like that there's an intense sunlight coming through those trees and it also makes the foliage look thicker as well. Um, now when you do this you know you want to make sure that, that you don't go overboard with it because if it's too much you know then it's then it won't be believable on there. Um, and so as you can see I'm kind of pushing that back and forth and back and forth um, and trying to soften up some of those edges where it gets to be too harsh um, in certain places. You know, and it's just constantly a push and pull where you go back and forth and back and forth with it to really find that right balance. Um, you would do this if you're doing traditional painting. This is no different than, than glazing paint over it. Um, and so if you kind of think of it that way, you know, you can kind of get a sense of, of kind of what you're, what I'm trying to accomplish with this. Is it's just thin glazes and things like that. Again, that's part of the reason why I'm drawn to painters because I can actually work like this and it really mimics traditional painting. Um, and so I can use a lot of those techniques that I learned um, from years of study with traditional painting. I can still apply all that same knowledge um, to what I'm doing digitally. Okay, here I'm painting in the coins, um, the, the little treasure that's behind her. Um, it's kind of a really great little Easter egg that the editor had suggested, um, was putting in these, these coins, and it's a fantastic solution. And so a lot of times um, when you're working professionally, um, you know, always be open to whatever suggestions uh, people have. Um, sometimes I've gotten suggestions from all sorts of people. Um, not all, it's not always artists, and usually they're, they're, they're good suggestions. So always be open to, to different ideas because sometimes people can bring wonderful suggestions to the table. Um, so that's, that's just one of those wonderful little things that, that working collaboratively with people you can get. Um, when I'm putting in these coins, one of the things that I'm doing is I'm not worried about putting in every little detail of every little coin. You know, I'm not going in and painting faces on every single little coin because that would be distracting visually. I just want to get the basic shapes and the basic values right and then let the paint be just a little bit rough around the edges um, because that way when you look at the painting you're not going to be overwhelmed with uh, all the little details of every little coin. Um, sometimes it's better to leave some little areas, I don't want to say unfinished, but, but, but it definitely looser um, than probably your main, your main character. Um, so you can see how I'm putting in these coins, but I'm not going in and putting in every little face or type or, or anything like that. I'm just implying those basic forms and shapes. Now you don't want to do that in your main areas like your faces and things like that. But when you move away from your main character and your main focus, it's not it's not always a bad idea. In fact, I think it's a pretty good idea sometimes to, to go in and just leave some areas that are a little looser um, so you can really see what you're trying to get um, to focus on. And that comes in really clear, but everything else it's just a little bit of a looser feel to it. Um, and so it's there, but it's not overly detailed. That'll help us focus on the other areas of the painting. 
Okay, um, as I'm finishing up these coins, one of the decisions I made was the Tiger was just way too bright up front. Um, so I wanted to push him back, and that kind of also adds to that kind of dappled light feel. Um, so I created a layer, and it's mostly just a gray layer, um, and I have it set to multiply at about 90%. Um, and so I'm just layering that over there and I have a really soft edge on it. And so I'm just kind of taking out little bits and pieces of that so that that tiger, um, as you can kind of see, I'm kind of bringing back on the mouth and some little areas around the, around the shoulders of the tiger, just to make sure that that way you can really see the tiger, um, bits and pieces of him, but he's kind of falling into shadow um, because I don't want him to be the main focus. And if I leave him super bright and lots of whites and contrast, He's going to draw away from the girl, and I don't want that to happen. I want you to focus on the girl more than the tiger. So that's why it's important to add that little layer on there. Now, I'll take that off as I paint in the, the coins and stuff because I don't want that to affect my color. But just by putting that, that on and off, it can kind of tell me what range I need to work in um, to make sure it's visible, but also at the same time um, just to make sure that it falls back into the background. Okay, um, this next technique that I use, I actually learned uh, from reading an, an issue of Imagine FX. Um, uh, it, it's to add just a little bit more tone to the faces. Uh, and, you know, now that even though pickup underlying color um, did add some tones to it, I still want her face to be a little bit richer in tone, a little bit richer in value, um, just to give her a little bit more life. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm basically painting, you know, reds on her cheeks, uh, some blues in the eyes. Uh, just above the, the eye, the upper eye, um, around the eyelid, and then just a little bit of yellows um, just below the eye and on the forehead, um, and then I'll put in some cooler tones, um, just a little bit uh, right around the, the lower area as it kind of pulls down. Then I'm going to blend all of those edges um, as, as it kind of you know, so that there's no sharp edges on the face and it all kind of blends together and I just kind of smoosh it all around. Then I throw it on an overlay layer and then back it off to like, you know, 10, 12, 8% somewhere in there. Um, I just want to be sure that it doesn't get to be too rich um, all over her face. Um, but just that subtlety and just adding just that little bit of tone uh, can really make a face pop. All right, this phase here is probably, in my opinion, the most important phase, uh, but probably the phase where you will see the least visible change um, in, the, in the actual painting and painting process. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm just taking my grainy blender and I'm just going in and softening up my edges uh, for between color to color. Uh, if you've ever painted traditionally with oils, um, what you learn is that you put two colors next to each other and then you just blend the edges. Well, that's kind of the process that I'm using here as I go in here and as I um, soften up all my edges and, and soften up all the, the areas of the painting. Um, so now all I'm doing is just blending those edges and making her look um, smoother around her skin tones and things like that. Uh, one mistake a lot of times illustrators will make uh, when they're first starting out when they're trying to, to create a painting like this um, and trying to get it realistic is you tend to overblend. blend 
Um, and I, I even catch myself doing it sometimes where I'll blend in an area and then have to go back in and pull that blend out. And that's one of the things the beauty of Painter is as long as you've got pickup underlying color on here, you know, I can work on a layer on top of everything. Um, and then if I screw that up, screw that and over blend it, I just erase my blended area and then just continue and re-blend that area again and just just don't get so heavy heavy handed with it. Uh, so, you know, as you're working on this, you know, in, in, in when you're working on blending areas, you know, always make sure that you're not over blending. I think that's the biggest mistake that, that you can ever that you can make. Uh, so as I'm doing this, I'm just concentrating on edges. I'm not trying to blend every little nook and cranny and make every color really smooth. I want there to be some brush strokes. I want there to be some, you know, some little bit of grain to it, uh, so it's not overly smooth in every little area. So, um, and like I said, I'm just using a grainy blender and just smoothing off edges. And if I feel like I've gone too far with it, then I just stop, back it off, erase what I did, and then try it again. And don't be afraid to do that. Don't feel like, oh, I overblended it. Well, it'll be fine. No, go ahead and take it off and, and, and try and do it again and again until you get it just right. You know, one of the things that as I'm working on this, I'm realizing that that overglow is just a little bit too much. Um, so I'm going to pull that back. I'll end up adding it in again later, um, but I'll end up backing it off just a little bit because it's kind of pulling away too much from the face. Okay, for this last step here, um, I want to add a little bit of darkness so the masthead will come off um, on the actual cover um, for the magazine. So to do that, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new layer, and then on that layer, I'm going to paint uh, a really dark kind of a grayish tone. Um, and that grayish tone will allow there to be uh, kind of that shadowish kind of cast across the top of the page. Um, that way the masthead that will be printed in white uh, will really leap off of there. Um, so I'm just kind of painting that in. I'm not really worried too much about the shape. I'm just taking it down as far as I want to. It almost gives a feel of that there's a, a streak of light coming right across the middle of the page. Um, and I really kind of like that effect so it will really even draw us into the main character. So I switch this to a multiply layer. Um, I then turn it to Right now I've got it about 50%. I'm probably going to pull it back even just a little bit more. Um, and I'm just kind of pulling it off of her so that she'll be outside of that shadow. Um, and so she'll kind of pop off just a little bit. Uh, and then I'll zoom in here on the hand and really get it, you know, erased off from the hand as much as possible. Uh, and so that it, and you don't have to be absolutely perfect with it, you know, when you're dealing with, with cast shadows and things like that. You can let it kind of overlap just a little bit. And actually, in some ways, it's kind of better if it does because um, it gives you a little bit of a softer edge on this. So this is my last step for this, and so I'm just going to kind of go in and uh, make sure that, that there's enough contrast between her and the background, um, and also the background isn't doesn't have too many light values, so the masthead will pop off real nice. Uh, All right, here's pretty much um, <clears throat> where I'm kind of going through and just making sure that everything is uh, cleaned up and, and I got nice smooth edges um, and, and everything looks pretty clean. Um, one of the last steps I'm going to do is I'm going to add an overlay. I've got uh, a yellow cast overlay. 
Um, I'm going to put that across the whole painting just to kind of help unify the colors. Um, it's an old trick uh, masters used to use is they would throw an overlay of color on top of an entire painting um, and that will help to unify the entire painting from beginning to end. Um, and that way when you look at the painting it makes complete sense um, color-wise uh, and there's a unity uh, amongst the colors. Um, so it's a, it's a little trick that the old masters used to use um, is just flood the entire painting with one color um, and it kind of helps to unify to keep everything in that same kind of color tone. Um, and then I save the file and that's pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. Thank you.